what was it about the period that we're talking about then, the 1940s, which which enabled a government and subsequently the the, the Attlee government to commit itself to full employment? Well, the, there was great. There was a very strong feeling in the public that uh, we, we mustn't go back the uh, old pre-war days and the uh, cabinet during the war was made up of the conservatives and the labor and the uh, liberals and uh, during the war for various reasons there was a strong uh, surge of feeling that uh, one should prepare for post-war period, it shouldn't be like the pre-war period. I think it was simply a state of mind of, uh, of the um, general nation, and, and uh, which went through the politicians. And it, but it was also a, a, a thing which enabled us to, um, to persuade the Americans that we were going to be good boys after all, and we would uh, produce a, a much better world with them. But presumably there was also a feeling that you could actually bring about for them point. Yes, there was indeed. Maynard Keynes, of course, was the uh, architect of that view, and uh, it was widely held that uh, by maintaining demand for goods and services, you would um, uh, be able to find jobs for everybody because there would uh, be a large market for their products. And that, you see, was uh, very much the, the opposite of the Treasury view, the so-called Treasury view. Joining the, and Maynard was in the Treasury, and uh, it was, just, it was uh, very dramatic that the white paper, the first sentence of the white paper, which, uh, which was a duty of the government to maintain a high and stable level of employment, was the Keynesian view as <laughs> against the Treasury view. And the rest of the white paper is full of Treasury. <laughs> but you clearly, uh, over the period of the next 10, 20 years, succeeded. Over the, yes, um, I have no doubt whatsoever the thing that went wrong, and I fear that it may happen again. That's fine. Uh, when they when they got to full employment, let's say two and a half percent, I think is what people call it now, instead of the ten percent or twenty percent is uh, in, my, in the sort of pre-war figures. With, uh, with a very high demand for products all around, there would be a runaway inflation of prices and of um, wage rates. And there's, there's no doubt that uh, the thing succeeded because people were very um, moderate about uh, wage claims and so on for these. Every now and then, there was stop go, if you remember. Every now and then, they had to uh, dampening down of demand. But it was in the uh, in the seventies and after the um, the oil crisis that uh, people uh, the attitude changed completely, and uh, different concerns put up prices and above all uh, different trade unions pushed wages up and then there, there became an explosive inflation and has only been killed by a huge uh, you know, reduction of total demand and a very vast unemployment again which has caused the moderation of the wage claims and um, and I have a horrible fear that if we got full employment again, there would uh, sooner or later be a 
this uh, revival of the, the bad old story and that the uh, crisis and retreats should get out of control again. Is it then your opinion that you cannot have a policy for full employment unless it includes some formal or informal method of controlling wages? Yeah, and, uh, and prices too, but wages, I think above all, yes, it is. Tell me why. Well, simply because if you don't, uh, I think, if you don't uh, have a change in methods of uh, price fixing and wage rate fixing, when you get a, a, a very large demand for goods and a very large demand for labor, so that everybody can sell anything they make and uh, anybody can find a job, they then find different concerns, individual concerns, find that they can bargain for still higher rate of uh, increase of uh, wages and prices. And then all the firms take it up one after the other, and then you get a situation in which um, uh, people are demanding more and more uh, a higher and higher level of prices and wage rates which can't really be paid uh, without a, a, a runaway inflation. So it's, it, um, I think there must be a rather radical change in the methods of uh, wage fixing and price fixing. What do you suggest? I suggest the, uh, I mean, quite lunatic proposals. But I think you've got to somehow other uh, persuade the workers and uh, and producers, but above all workers, that uh, they should uh, accept lower wages than they could get in, uh, in the individual firm by bargaining. And uh, in order to do that, I think you've got to uh, in order to face the lower level of uh, wages, uh, you've got to, I think, pay, uh, well, um, uh, um, it's called a citizen's income now, some general pop-up to incomes which does not come through um, the wage uh, system. Do you think then that people, this current debate about, reawakened debate about full employment is to some extent dishonest in that it is not, no one is spelling out as far as I know, the, the implications for wages. Well, I think that's, I think you're saying what I was saying. Yes, it's not uh, not necessarily dishonest, but it's incomplete. I mean, people, you see, people do genuinely believe now that we've uh, had this experience and that they're not going to, uh, they're not going to increase demand government expenditure and lower taxes and lower rates of interest and so on, uh, so long as there uh, is any sign of the inflation increasing seriously. So it's my belief that, uh, that it will start to increase before you get to 2.5% unemployment. And it's not necessarily dishonest. It's and there are people, very serious people, very serious economists, who believe that uh, that one can carry this through without a resuscitation of uh, runaway inflation. I doubt it very much, and I think we ought to start at once thinking of what we could do to prevent it recurring when we get down to, say, 2.5% unemployment. But you don't think a target of 2.5% unemployment is, is an impossibility. I personally, I personally think it is not possible without very radical change. And, uh, um, I have in, in the pamphlet, which you may have seen, outlined the sort of changes. Now, they are politically tried cuckoo land at the moment. But uh, I think one pegs away, and I think when the time comes, 
uh, people will be very uh, determined not to let there be another runaway inflation. And uh, I think at that time they will begin to realize that they can't get, uh, they may have got down to 8% unemployment or something, or, or um, 7%, 5%. They can't really go further unless they have some rather radical change. So the program that was laid out in the White Paper in 1944, I was reading it the other day, and it still seems eminently sensible and eminently achievable. I mean, if you were writing that white paper today, would you would you would you write it in? This, in this, would you be proposing exactly the same measures? I, I want to emphasise the fact that I didn't write the white paper. I never started the ball rolling to be considered this matter. I, but the, I do think that the white paper and Maynard Keynes did not put enough emphasis on the threat of uh, a runaway inflation. And you see, that's what happened uh, the, after these 10 or 20 years of, of success after the war. The, uh, the, the prices did begin to run away again, and, uh, and they tried, uh, remember, income's policies and God knows what. I think you need something more radical than that, which will make people rely less on the wage they're getting, and more on the welfare state. Just, just briefly, could you explain how your radical measure would work? I know you say it's cloud cookie land, but let's assume okay. that you're the Prime Minister of cloud cookie land. How would it work? <laughs> well, it's, it's, a, it's a package that works with uh, many things at the same time. I first of all think uh, that, you, if, that there's no hope of uh, getting people to accept these changes unless you have an income which is alternative to uh, uh, which is now called a citizen's income, it used to be called a social dividend. Uh, and that's one part of it. Another part of it is I, I would like to see the state owning the, the beneficiary, beneficial ownership of uh, a large part of capital. Now that is not nationalizing particular industries, but it's uh, uh, the result of fiscal policy, which begins to get rid of the national debt and builds up a national asset instead towards the finance of this uh, social dividend. And I think that the uh, there have to be heavy taxes on, well, particularly on energy and uh, so on. We've got to find the money to uh, prevent the control of wages from leading to an unfair distribution of income. Just a final question. You, I, I know you, you're not planning to go to the conference tomorrow, um, but if you were there, um, and you had to give a brief message to those people who are gathered there, about, I mean, I think the conference was towards full employment. Yes. Well, what would your message be? Well, my first simple message would be to, uh, to begin thinking now about what you'll do about uh, the problem. This is the real thing. To begin thinking now. My, my uh, solutions may be nonsensical, there may be other solutions, but to begin thinking now very carefully about what you'll do if the, the as you get towards full employment, there reappears a, a, a threat of a runaway inflation. You see, they aren't thinking about that. They're just assuming it just <laughs> isn't going to happen. And that's really the first message. I would then say, well, I, I put down certain package deals that I think might work, but there may be many other package deals that would work. That's the, what I would say at the tomorrow's conference. I wouldn't uh, try to, to sell my 
what I call topsy-turvy nationalization and uh, citizens' income and so on. Because it's all, it's all a single package. You've got to have the right monetary policy, the right uh, fiscal policy, and the right uh, policy towards monopolies and so on. Okay. And, uh, it isn't just one single thing that I... I'm happy. I mean, I don't even make it any longer. We've covered everything about at the moment. I'm sorry, could you repeat that question? Yeah. What, what is your point about yeah. um, thinking ahead? What is the single most important message that you would give to the people who are now talking about full employment? I would start at the wage fixing end. That the thing they should concentrate on, start thinking on, and concentrate on, is realization that it may be necessary to have some curb on uh, wage fixing and price fixing and start there and uh, I think from that the whole problem would develop but in order to persuade people to accept that sort of thing you'll have to do a lot of uh, other things. Are you pessimistic or optimistic? It sounds to me that on the one hand you're saying that if you put the right policies in place, you can have full employment. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you're saying, I don't think we'll do it. Oh, I'm sure you won't do it at once. But we haven't got to the problem yet. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I think that the um, contribution of an economist like myself can be is to say, I am not going to talk about the political difficulties. Uh, things do change, you know, very, very dramatically. If you think back, uh, uh, there have been enormous changes, and uh, this, this will need some enormous changes. And, but I think uh, it is the job of the economist to say there will be, A, there will be a need for radical change, and B, here are some proposals for you to think about. Without claiming, you see, it makes nonsense of the economist if you, if you try to, to say that, that Mr. Major now should start uh, uh, my topsy-turvy nationalization or my, or my uh, labor capital partnerships in industry and so on. But what you're saying is not in, if they have the will to put into place the package or a package, mm -hmm. it is not impossible. Yes, that's I, I certainly. I'm I'm an optimist. I'm an old uh, friend and colleague of Maynard Keynes, and he 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 revolutionised the ideas, and there's no reason why. Uh, Somebody shouldn't revolutionize the ideas now. Don't be me, and uh, I'm more or less in my grave. But, but if people should really begin to think about it, that's what that's for. And should start, I think, by thinking about the change in wage fixing arrangements.